Thank you, Binay. Uh, thank you for organizing this, for inviting me, and for especially for uh, developing an amazing work with the Binay Tara Foundation, which I'm hopeful that uh, each of you will have more time and chance to uh, know better over the next couple of days and get engaged with us because it's an amazing journey. Uh, my first talk this morning uh, is uh, on uh, myeloperfusive neoplasm. Uh, which are diseases that have been uh, neglected for many years and in the last probably five, ten years uh, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of uh, discoveries including treatment uh, implementation that has been more interesting. Um, I have only disclosure, the previous ad ad board uh, with Insight. Um, it's interesting because until a few years ago we would talk about uh, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytemia and, and uh, Myelofibrosis more, mostly as a morphologic entity and a clinical uh, picture of splenomegaly and patients uh, not doing well for, for until they, they had uh, inactive leukemia uh, eventually or had other cardiovascular diseases. Now we talk about these diseases more as a uh, well-defined uh, um, genetically uh, uh, different types of diseases and we know now that at least 90, probably 9 percent of the polycythemia vera patients will have a, a, some mutation, mostly a JAK2 mutation, uh, and essential thrombocytemia and myelofibrosis also can be divided based on their uh, genetic um, uh, phenotype or uh, genotype in, by, uh, in particular by looking at JAK2 mutation or cataracticular mutation that was uh, discovered a couple of years ago, um, which covers a lot of these patients in their, um, in their uh, genomics. Now the reason is not only by a diagnostic purpose but also as I'll show you in a, in a few minutes it also uh, evaluating in terms of for their prognosis and uh, it's very easy to think that down the line in the next few years probably there will be more targeted drugs for all, many of these uh, mutations. But um, and some of the mutations actually are related not only to JAK2 or chiroticulin but some of the mutations are of uh, epigenetic mutations like uh, IDH1 and 2, TAT2, uh, DNA3A, AXLS1, which actually has a very poor prognostic value and, and other mutations. But before we go to the, to the treatment, I want to know, I want to just uh, take the chance to show that uh, three months ago there was a new um, reclassification by WHO of, uh, of hematologic malignancies. And there are a few changes that, that were, uh, were published uh, again in May, and I wanted to just uh, point them out uh, with you. There's a new entity called the, the prefibrotic early stage of myelofibrosis. So the, the primary myelofibrosis now has a prefibrotic early stage and a fibrotic stage. Um, and uh, the other change, well, there's still an MDS, MPN, unclassifiable entity that I'm sure that those of you who see hematologic patients may have seen in, in some patients. And there's a specific entity as acute pymylosis, myelofibrosis in, in, in the AML um, uh, classification. In polycythemia vera, um, the criteria are the same as before, but you can see here the, the values have been lowered a little bit. The hemoglobin uh, values to, for a diagnosis of polycythemia vera are now 16.5 for men and 16 for women, and 49 of hematocrit and 48 for, for, uh, for men and 48 for women. Um, these were before we're 18 and 18.5 uh, and 18. Uh, most of the patients actually will have, uh, we will have the diagnosis by looking at the, um, of course, hemoglobin or hematocrit value. Um, and one of the mutations that actually are very, very common or the JAK2 uh, V16, uh, 17F mutation or the exon 12 mutation or other um, uh, epigenetic mutation, as they said. And the serum erythropoietin level, which is most in most of these cases, is, is low. You cannot read here. Uh, just trust me. The um, the, myelof the 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 new entity, the prefibrotic myelofibrosis entity, uh, is basically diagnosed based on a bone marrow biopsy. And uh, some of these patients actually usually have a, uh, a high level, a high number of platelets. And so the difference between the ET and and the pre prefibrotic MF we mostly be on the, morph on the morphology of the bone marrow where the, the, the ET patients only have dysplastic megakaryocytes and increased number of megakaryocytes with a normal 
the rest of the, of the, of the myeloid cells are normal. Uh, in the prefibrotic myelofibrosis, there is a, 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 um, an increase uh, cellularity with the granulocytic proliferation and, uh, and decrease erythropoiesis. So it's a, it's a patho pathology-driven diagnosis, and uh, um, both actually can have a grade one uh, fibrosis. Um, another change that actually has been uh, more important uh, in, the, in the scenario of, of, of MPNs in the last few years has been to, to give the right value and to, and to measure the symptoms that these patients actually have or may have for a long time in their life and the, and the weight that these symptoms have in the disease and uh, in, in their quality of life and in the management. So uh, Ruben Mesa actually has pioneered this actually type of work in MPNs by measuring the, um, the, the, all the, the, weight, the burden of the symptom, uh, like uh, night sweats, fever, fatigue, um, weight loss, itching, all these things in, in the MPN uh, picture. And you see here that actually almost 90% of the patient have, uh, have a fatigue and uh, uh, all the other symptoms uh, that, that can be related. Now the, the objection could be, well, these symptoms are quite are constitutional symptoms. And many people who do not have MPNs may have the same symptoms. If you ask people how tired you are, or so there actually has been a study to compare the general population to, to, the, um, to the MPN patients here. And you see actually that in this graph, the, the burden of the symptom burden in MPN patients with a rel the yellow uh, uh, arrow here is way much bigger than the normal general population in all the symptoms, uh, you know, including cough, uh, depression, numbness, so all these things that you could think may not be related. So MPNs basically cause a significant burden in terms of quality of life, of overall um, symptomatic experience for, for these patients. So um, I think that is, it's reasonable when we decide what treatment to offer to a patient to, put, to, to consider a, a bunch of things. Uh, Certainly, the risk that these patients have in their disease, and we'll go uh, in, a, in a second to the prognostic factors. What is the risk of the disease? What is the symptom burden that the patient has? Do we need to address the, the symptoms more than the disease? And then in some cases, actually, in, in polycythemia viral ET patients, may be the case. What is the patient's age and personal plans? If we have to talk about uh, uh, doing phlebotomies or, or taking a pill, or uh, undergoing like different type of treatment. Uh, the prognostic assessment in terms of uh, life expectancy. And of course, in myelofibrosis patients, whether or not there's a possible cure, which can only be right now with the bone marrow transfer. And when I talk about MPM burden and, and the decision to be made in the treatment, we can talk about uh, do we need, does the patient need to to treat the, the cytopenia or the, or the leukocytosis or the, the elevated number of places or, or, or red cells? Uh, does the patient uh, plan to have uh, children? Pregnancy, uh, young patients with ET or PV actually are, um, it's a common question that we, we face uh, in our patients. Uh, should they be on hydroxyurea? Should they rather be on interferon because it's safer to, to get pregnant? Um, and how to handle? Because when a patient with high risk PV is pregnant, then the risk of, of, of for the baby and for the mother is very high, and so these are all decisions to be made based on the patient characteristics, and then of course the, the fatigue, the symptoms, and the and the cardiovascular risk. So, the standard prognostic factors remain for ET and PV mostly the age of the patient uh, and the prior uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, there are multiple papers also showing leukocytes, and in fact, in this. Uh, to the Teferi criteria and the, the international criteria, they have been also accounted for. Uh, the leukocytosis has been uh, in independent prognostic factors, but remain mostly that the age and the prior vascular uh, events constitute a, 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 key, a, a key factor in order to, for example, uh, to put the patient on, um, on aspirin if he has a, if or she has ET, uh, or to be more aggressive in the, in the, in the treatment. In myelofibrosis, there's been uh, multiple prognostic uh, uh, scores. Uh, we now follow most of the times the DIPSS+, uh, which is a combination of prognostic f uh, factors like age, 
uh, anemia, leukocytosis, blasts in the peripheral blood and symptoms, and in addition to that, a low number of platelets and cytogenetics. Uh, these actually classification stratifies the patient with a very different prognosis. The low risk patients have a, over 10 years, 15 years survival, uh, and the high risk patients or intermediate two risk patients actually have a very dismal survival, less than two years or, or, or barely three years. If, if in, in some cases. So these patients actually are the patients we, we look at more, with more um, interest for, uh, for a transplant. But as I said before, the new gen genomics of the, that, we, that have been discovered actually have a prognostic value too. The, the mutation of caroticlin actually is a good factor for these patients. The presence of, uh, of uh, the caroticlin mutation decreases the risk of thrombo uh, thrombotic events in, if, in essential thrombocythemia. So this means actually that it's very important when we diagnose these patients to also ask for the um, genetics of, of, of in the diagnostic profile. In myelofibrosis, caroticlin mutation also is associated with the best survival. And you see here the comparison with the other three commons, the other two commons mutations in myelofibrosis, caroticlin uh, mutation significantly increases the survival of myelofibrosis patients compared to JAK2 mutation or MPL mutation. And more importantly, patients who actually the triple negative patients who do not have neither the M MPL or JAK2 or caroticlin mutation uh, have the worst prognosis. So as in other solid tumors, the triple negative is bad. And triple negative patients um, are not, the majority actually are, is a small uh, number of patients, but actually these are patients who have a very, very short period uh, survival expectancy. I said before, as ASL1 mutation also has been shown to have a worse prognosis than, uh, than uh, in the other mutations, and is considered like a, a factor in myelofibrosis to, 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 be a very, to be more aggressive in the, in, in, in the treatment. Now, these studies do not have a, a, a they're not yet um, phase three studies or, 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 or very long uh, pro, uh, prospective studies, but, but this is actually what the clinical uh, experience shows in, in, in big centers where the patients are uh, seen more often like Mayo Clinic or, or uh, B. Anderson. So in the, in the attempt to, 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 to give a prognostic score also to the molecular profile of the patient, these were, they were uh, added to the DS, DIPSS score, and by doing the molecular stratification, uh, you see that actually the patients at high risk which, with the worst pr uh, molecular profile also have the worst survival um, in, compared to the other myelofibrosis patients. So after this introduction in, in, in the prognostic uh, uh, scenario, well, what, 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 how, do I treat, how do we treat these patients? Um, it, there are like milestones that have, that have not changed, that have been known for a long time, like the, the, the use of uh, aspirin in polycythemia vera. It's a very important, uh, it's a very important uh, procedure, treatment that we, we, we do all the time, unless the patient is on anticoagulation. Um, so that is important. But this is not, and, and as well as in, 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 uh, in polycythemia vera, the target of, of keeping the hematocrit below 45 uh, which we have known for many, many years, for decades, but it was only demonstrated in a formal way only a few years ago, uh, and is very important. So the, it reduces the risk of vein thrombosis and cardiovascular deaths. So 45 is a target that we keep for every patient, and then there are different approaches also for women to keep it at a little bit lower, at 43, but uh, definitely 45 is, is a, so how to pursue that Right now, you know, the standard ways is with hydroxyurea, which has been the standard uh, drug and easy to use for a long time. Uh, phlebotomies, when the patient, some patients prefer phlebotomies over hydrea, some patients do not want phlebotomies, and some patients do need both of them. Uh, the new drugs that we, we're gonna talk in a second also help decrease the hematocrit, and then we probably will, will uh, help us in, in, in keeping this level lower than, than 45. In ET patients, and that's a, a very common, actually, especially from practitioners outside the, the academic uh, areas. We do not give uh, aspirin to ET patients. Uh, ET patients, unless they are over 60 years of age uh, and or have had a prior thrombotic event. So a patient uh, with a million platelets and no risk factors should not be on, a, on, on aspirin. 
Uh, this is not very easy for many people in, in communities or in, where they are in small centers or small offices where they feel more comfortable and safer giving aspirin to, to patients with a million platelets. The risk of that actually some of these patients will bleed because the platelets do not really function as well as normal platelets. So the risk of, of hemorrhages is not less than thrombotic events. So we should not do that. And agrolide is another old drug that was abandoned for a while and there have been major studies showing also that indeed it's a good drug, drug in ET patients uh, if uh, most of these patients actually do not tolerate hydroxyurea or don't like the hydroxyurea, we try the agrolide and uh, it, it has comparable uh, outcome uh, to, to hydroxyurea. But the new things actually, going back again to the, to the genomics of these diseases, the JAK2 mutation uh, discovery was, has prompted a lot of uh, efforts from, from uh, corporate, uh, from drugs, companies, and from hedge funds, from a lot of people who invested a lot of money in this, in this area. And the JAK2 mutation basically, uh, sorry, the JAK2 mutation uh, implies that through the cells will signal through the STAT pathway uh, uh, to the nucleus in the indefinitely and will not require any engagement of the, receptor, of the cytokine receptor outside the, the, the membrane to signal, to give the signal to the cells to, uh, to function for the, 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 the specific uh, uh, cytokines. Many cytokines depend on the JAK2 uh, and, and STAT uh, pathway. Which means actually that in, in, in what happened in, uh, in, in, in malofibrosis is that by treating the patient, by developing a JAK2 inhibitor, or a JAK1, a JAK inhibitor, not JAK2, it was a JAK, pan-JAK inhibitor. It was shown actually there was a very quick decrease in the release of many pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines ended up being responsible for many symptoms that patients with malofibrosis had. So by turning off very quickly the cytokines by a JAK inhibitor, patients felt much better. The splenomegaly shrunk very quickly, the fatigue, the fever, the, the overall status of the patient improves in, in uh, can improve in, in, as quick as in a week or two and uh, with a significant change in the quality of life of these patients. All because of the cytokine uh, decrease. Of course, this, this immune mechanism of, of, uh, of the JAK inhibitor, uh, ruxolitinib was actually the drug is right now the, the only one approved by FDA, um, has, is taking this drug also towards other other, other places uh, outside the malofibrosis in, in uh, autoimmune diseases and, uh, and other areas. But what was interesting actually there was a, 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 a prospective study that showed, it was published uh, last year in the New England Journal, that even poly patients with polycythemia there benefit from a rexolinib treatment in terms of both splenomegaly, if they had splenomegaly, and also in uh, controlling the, the level of hematocrit. So the hematocrit decreases while using uh, this drug. The only side effect, well, the, not the only one, the major side effects of this drug is actually can cause thrombocytopenia. So patients who have a lower number of places actually may not uh, be treated or you have to titrate down the dose and it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated. In ET and PV, another very interesting drug I think is, uh, is actually uh, very quickly developing. There's more data coming out. I think this ASH meeting in December will also show more data on, on, on new trials, is the use of pegylated interferon. Uh, pegylated interferon is a drug that has been used for many diseases. Um, it was shown uh, kind of five, six years ago that it, both in PV and in ET patients could induce a complete response in a very high number of hematological response in a very proportion of patients. Um, there was a trial that actually was uh, reported last year, ASH, where different doses of, of, of interferon were tested. Pegylated interferon is a, is a, a subcutaneous injection, which is, can be given uh, weekly. And uh, compared to the non-pegylated interferon, has much less side effects, but much well tolerated. And with a seven-year uh, trial story, uh, the results were actually are pretty uh, encouraging with a, a 60 uh, percent of the patients actually have a complete hematologic re response, and, um, which is actually durable. And it also decreases the, the allele burden of the JAK2 mutation in these patients. So it has an effect against the clone, uh, decreasing the, 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 the allele burden. Um, the concern, of course, is always the symptoms. 
And in fact, there are symptoms related to the pegylate inter peg interference. I, I have uh, several patients treated with pegylate interference, and I have to say that actually it's, it's easy to, to modulate the treatment by decreasing the dose or skipping one week. And uh, most of these patients actually can have, can tolerate better the interference with some modifications. But the severe side effects are very rare. There are currently um, two ongoing clinical trials uh, within the uh, Myeloproliferative Disorders Research Consortium, which is an alliance of many centers in the United States and in Europe, uh, by co to compare uh, upfront hydroxyurea with pegylated interferon in newly diagnosed patients with ET and PV. I think there may be some uh, in initial data presented at ASH for the initial uh, analysis. And there's also a combination of uh, pegyl interferon with MDM2, uh, which is a, um, it targets P53, and the combination may actually be um, synergistic in, in these patients. Myelofibrosis is a more, a little bit more complicated disease to treat. Splenectomy has been debated for many, many years. As a transplant uh, physician, uh, the, the discussion is never finished. We continue to, to argue, yes or no. Uh, Myelofibrosis patients very often have a big spleen. Uh, I think the consensus right now is that splenectomy could be valuable if the patient has a very large spleen and is symptomatic uh, and has not been successfully treated with, uh, with a JAK inhibitor, either because it doesn't work or because the patient doesn't tolerate the treatment. So in those patients uh, with, with a big spleen and with pain due to the spleen or cachexia due to the splenomegaly, uh, splenex, splenectomy can be indicated, although there are risks associated with the surgery, which have to be taken into consideration. Before the JAK inhibitors came on in, into, the, into play, the, the standard treatment for myelofibrosis were, as you know, androgens, erythropoietin, there's been tried with thalidomide, uh, low-dose bisulfan, hydroxyurea, 2-CDA have been, has been tried, uh, lenalidomide more recently. Uh, and steroids, which is not listed here, but also very commonly given to these patients to control the symptoms. Uh, the big change was actually ruxolitinib, which uh, again, the, the JAK inhibitor, that was uh, tested in, 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 in two major trials, COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2, uh, COMFORT-2 being in phase three studies, comparing the uh, ruxolitinib to the best uh, treatment available for these patients uh, upon the choice of the physicians. And uh, uh, the results of this trial actually led the, the, the drug to be FDA approved with a significant improvement in, in the splenomegaly of these patients in a very quite fast uh, fashion and durable responses um, and uh, improvement, improvement of the symptoms as well. So symptoms and splenomegaly were decreased. Um, interestingly, there's no really direct effect on, on the fibrosis of the patients. So these drugs do not really affect so much the, the, the clone, but the overall, uh, by improving the symptoms and the splenomegaly, um, the patient actually not only feels better, but probably is also the reason why they live longer. And there's a significant survival advantage in, uh, in patients with, uh, on treatment with ruxolitinib complete, compared to the um, standard of care, whatever standard of care is, uh, in, in a longer, longer follow-up uh, study. Um, Patients who actually have a better response to ruxolinib with a splenda, with a reduced in the spleen also have an overall survival, an increased overall survival. Uh, so the, the response of ruxolinib is actually uh, important in terms of, of, of prognostic uh, value. So after ruxolinib was actually introduced, there's uh, many different other drugs have been tried and have been developed to improve on the ruxolinib uh, activity, especially because, as I said before, JAK2 mutation is a mutation of the JAK2. Ruxolinib is not a JAK2 inhibitor. It blocks JAK1 and JAK2 and, uh, and JAK3. And so the idea was if we can narrow down to only a JAK2 inhibitor, we may actually have a better outcome, better response. So one of the drugs actually that uh, was tested, uh, Fedrexinib, was uh, successful in, uh, in decreasing the symptoms and the splenomegaly as well as the ruxolinib, but had major some uh, encephalopathies actually that stopped the trial. Um, right there. Uh, new new uh, JAK inhibitors are that right now are on, in phase three studies are the uh, pacritinib, <coughs> which is a both JAK2 and a FLE3 inhibitor. 
uh, which actually has been shown to be effective even in patients with a lower number of platelets to begin with. So thrombocytopenia in patients can successfully be treated with this drug. <coughs> the phase three studies will, will show us the final outcome. Um, and it increases splenomegaly, increases the symptoms in these patients. And the red cell uh, blood trans uh, transfusion dependency. So it's, it's, it's another good inject inhibitor. Another one actually has been developed is Momolotonib. Uh, Can I say that? A JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor is also in a phase three study. The phase two study was actually promising. Um, and then there's a new drug, which actually is very interesting, is a PRM151, which is a human PTX2 inhibitor. It basically blocks, um, uh, it, it, it prevents the, the, the fibrosis by uh, acting on a tissue repair uh, mechanism of uh, in the macrophages. And the data with the initial studies on, 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 on PRM151 is actually that it, did, it does decrease the fibrosis in patients uh, with myelofibrosis, and it does improve the hematologic picture. So this is also very uh, interesting and, but a very actually interesting drug that was uh, published uh, last year was uh, um, a telomerase uh, inhibitor uh, called imetalstat. And this drug, I think for the first time, showed that the fibrosis in the bone marrow of this patient can reverse to normal. This could be also only seen before with a bone marrow transplant. The reason why the bone marrow transplant is, is a curative disease is because we can reverse the, the, the fibrosis in the bone marrow. This drug in a small number of patients and in a very selected number of patients, uh, out of 33 patients, seven who are all JAK2 positive had a, a mild of the fibrosis actually reversed into a complete remission. Now the question remains on uh, how long these results will last and what are the the, the, the overall uh, clinical picture down the line, but is, I think is a very new and, and important change in the, in the treatment scenario of, of myelofibrosis. And there are studies right now open uh, with the metastat uh, for this patient resistant to other, uh, any other drug. Another interesting drug that has been developed is the uh, Aurora kinase inhibitor, uh, which actually is important in, in megakaryocytes. So by blocking the Aurora kinase inhibitor, the Aurora kinase in megakaryocytes, supposed to be f to, to reverse or to block the, the, the fibrosis that is caused by the megakaryocyte um, activity. And there's a clinical trial right now going on uh, on myofibrosis patients resistant to ruxolinib. Now, of course, the future is going to be combinations for uh, most of the drugs. Ruxolinib also has been tested with a bunch of drugs, the old ones and the new ones. Uh, there are trials open in, in, in all these combinations. Some of them actually in combination with, uh, with interferon, with danazole, with pomalidomide, with the uh, HDAC inhibitor, with 5 azacitidine and all these I think are coming up very soon and uh, will we'll tell us what the, the combination is. Now, as I said before, the only curative strategy is bone marrow transplant from myofibrosis. No other drug so far has been useful. We showed that many years ago that actually the bone marrow uh, can become back to normal within a year after the transplant. Uh, even using a reduced intensity chemotherapy in the preparation time uh, regimen. Um, the indication for a transplant in myelofibrosis have been discussed. A, there was a consensus uh, paper uh, published in Leukemia last year where we discussed who and when and how and where and all this kind of uh, discussion. Patient with a, with an intermediate sc uh, uh, score, uh, with an intermediate one score, could be candidates for transplant if they had a, a disease that is changing, uh, progressing. Um, if they have a matched sibling, it's, it's easier. Um, if they have a percentage of blast increasing, that does not increase the, 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 the prognostic score, but having in, the, in the, the prognostic score, having one blast or 10% blast is, is the same value. But if there's a change, it's definitely an indication. Phase, uh, intermediate two and, and high risk patients definitely uh, have a much longer chance of survival with the transplant than, than for, with any other treatment. So we now consider patients up to 70 years of age for transplant using reduced intensity regimens. Um, and with then, then the question remains with the JAK inhibitor whether or not, I'll talk one in a second about that too. So the studies have shown actually reduced intensity are very good for most of the patients. There have been so far only two prospective studies of transplant in myelofibrosis. One was the European study published by Nicholas Kroger 
years ago, um, we used in a combination of low-dose busulfan, fludarabine, and ATG in the clinician regimen. And they showed in German, in the German study showed uh, that patients are less than 50 years of age, 55 years of age, with a matched donor and a, a intermediate high risk, there's a list score, L score, they do actually 70% 70, 70 of the patient will survive. And these are patients with a, a prognosis of, let's say, less than four years otherwise. The other study was done in the United States and Europe. We published the study a few years ago, and we showed actually with the fludarby melphalan regimen and ATG for the unrelated, that the patient who had to transfer from a match-related donor from a sibling had a very good outcome, regardless of uh, um, HLA, HLA comp complete full match, mismatch, um, and uh, also JAK2 or JAK2 negative, or years also the age was not a difference as opposed to the unrelated donor transplant, which actually have a much higher risk of rejection. And that actually uh, caused the, 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 a higher mortality in this patient population. The risk factor for transplant have been demonstrated, have been shown to be age or objective mutation, uh, not having the objective mutation symptoms. But I think there's, there's not been yet a final uh, uh, consensus on all the risk factors because they are changing also the, the, the different uh, what, I, what did I do? Okay. Because the things are changing. So this is a, a very interesting paper that was published uh, a few last year showing that actually haplotransplant can be done in malofibrosis in a very successful manner. This is an Italian study by Andrea Bacigalupo showing that uh, with the condition regimen including fludarabine, thiotipa, and busulfan and cyclophosphamide post-transplant, uh, bad sibling and haplotransplant have the same outcome. Uh, with a follow-up of, of uh, uh, here is only like four or five months, but I think that this is a very impressive uh, outcome uh, with new regimen. So haplotransplant is changing the whole world of transplant in any disease that we transplant. I think malafibrosis will also have this, this future. The persistent objective mutation is a very useful tool in, in the transplant setting because it will allow us to, is a minimal residual disease marker that will allow us to give donor lymphocyte infusions and DLI and treat the patient earlier before they redevelop the fibrosis. Um, and again, the role of chiroreticular mutation was also validated in a transplant setting. So patients who actually had the chiroreticular mutation in this initial study show, were shown to have a better outcome even with a transplant. So chiroreticular mutation gives a good prognosis overall to all the malofibrosis patients. The, the rationale for rejecting inhibitor uh, in transplant, of course, is very strong. Uh, you think you can reduce the symptoms, you can reduce the splenomegaly, you can improve the performance status, you can decrease the cytokines, the, the cytokine storm in a transplant, so JAK2 inhibitor prior to transplant seems a very good idea. Actually, we don't know yet. There's a study, uh, this was a study showing actually it's feasible. Um, we actually, there's an open trial in the MPD consortium testing the role of JAK inhibitor prior to transplant. Um, it's not clear yet if the JAK inhibitor prior to transplant gives an advantage. Uh, we, we hope so. We don't have yet data on graphic disease, on engraftment, on side effects, on infection. Uh, but I think that's what everybody thinks we should do and we are doing as, as we speak. So, reduced intensity regimens are safe and uh, I think to my, my, to my knowledge are the, the best way to go for any age. Uh, match related, unrelated, or haplo. Well, there will be, we will need to have a, a prospective study to compare them, but I think the haplo will probably be as good as the others. We don't know yet about the JAK inhibitors, and the, the question will be if the telomeres inhibitor reverses the fibrosis, should be that an alternative to transplant or not? I think that we don't have that uh, result yet because we don't know the outcome of this patient long term. I think this is my last question, slide, and I thank you for being here. Thank you.